Hi, you're listening to She Shield, your one-stop pod for all topics personal safety. I'm your host, Sophia, and my goal is to help educate women and men on concealed carry, martial arts, and all topics self-defense. Today, we have Riley Bowman on the show. I'm so excited he's here. I met Riley at the Guardian Conference in, uh, oh my gosh, where was it located? I just... Just my brain. Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, of course. Yes. Um, this just a few months ago, not too long ago. Um, it was an incredible experience. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, I'm so thankful he's here to share his treasure trove of knowledge. So, Riley, I would love for you to introduce yourself to the pod. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, so, yes, Riley Bowman, I'm the 2IC or second in command at Concealed Carry Inc. and our family of companies. Uh, which includes a number of brands. Uh, first of all, Concealed Carry Inc., our main website is concealedcarry.com. And that's kind of where we got started, was heavily in the concealed carry focused arena. Um, primarily, initially doing concealed carry training uh, through a network of instructors across the country. And then we added product sales, and that grew and overtook everything else. And so quickly, our business became more product sale focused instead of only training. And then over the years, we've added brands like uh, Range Tech Shot Timers would be one of the longer running ones that we've had. Mountain Man Medical for trauma kit and medical supplies. Um, Barrel Block, uh, which is a dry fire safety training device. And uh, let's see, what else am I missing here? KSG Armory Holsters, mm -hmm. and uh, which is our more recent acquisition. And we're... we're Thrilled with that one because we talked for years actually as concealedcarry.com. We're like, gosh, it would make sense to, you know, sell holsters on our website. And we started yeah. doing that and selling other <laughs> yeah. people's holsters. But we're like, it'd be great if we had our own brand of holsters too, you know, mostly yes. from a profitability standpoint. So uh, we uh, had the opportunity to land in our lap to acquire KSG Armory. And uh, uh, I, that's actually where I spend more of my time than I expected uh, these days and just kind of overseeing the growth of that brand. And, uh, and then, yeah, I still do training um, all over the country. I do a number of classes per year. I teach at some training conferences. You mentioned the Guardian Conference, which is the conference that concealedcarry.com runs. Um, but I also have taught in at the like this last year, I taught at a girl in a gun national conference. I taught at uh, the active self-protection national conference. Um, I've taught at a few other events here and there through the years. Um, so, you know, and then, and then I like to try to get out and share uh, my own personal curriculum, uh, through, uh, the pistol intelligence series of courses that I teach. And so, oh, and then there's the competitive si shooting side of things. Uh, you know, it's like, I, there's a lot, a lot I could touch on Sophia, yes. but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I got started in competing in three gun back in 2016. Yeah, and a couple of years later, decided to focus mostly on the pistol side. So I switched over to pretty much just competing in USPSA now, uh, which uh, I've enjoyed thoroughly. And and you know, it, I, I'm pretty passionate about it. I try to go to as many big matches as I can, shoot a couple of nationals each year, and I do respectably well there. And continually trying to to get better at that as well. And yeah, it's, that's honestly my, my passion is, is, you know, as a, as an individual is co shooting competitively, um, uh, cause I love how it pushes me to get better and it's just fun to do as well. So, and it's nice that overall the stuff I learn from that and take from that, I think also benefits me professionally in my, my actual job as well. And so that's kind of fun and cool too. And then finally, I'm a, husband, a father of five beautiful children, and uh, they're constantly keeping me on my toes. So there you go. That's the, <laughs> that's the Riley Bowman intro. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. Very concise, but also just you're a man of many traits. So I'm so glad you're here because I don't think I've had anyone quite this balanced in the world of competitive shooting as well as concealed carry shooting. So I'm excited to get your perspective on the way those two worlds come together. I've read a little bit online, just doing my little research before the podcast episode um, about how you connect those worlds, but I'm excited for you to say yeah. it um, kind of for the first time on She Shield. Uh, so I'd first like to start with where, what was your first experience with a firearm? And was it kind of from there that it, your journey began, you became interested in learning more and just couldn't get enough or what's your story like? 
I, I grew up in rural Idaho, and our family, you know, meaning the extended family, grandpa, grandma, aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, you know, we, we liked guns. We went camping together. We did family reunions together. We shot guns together. Probably my earliest memory was four or five years old. Um, and I just remember being at one of those family get togethers and, uh, shooting a 22 and thinking that was, I mean, at that point I was like, guns are awesome. I love guns, you know? Right. Uh, and so thus began the, the love affair with, with <laughs> firearms from an early age. Um, but I was, I was mostly casual about it. Just a average kind of American gun owner, uh, got into hunting as well in my teens and, and, you know, it was just part of the lifestyle. But I wasn't super serious about it from, well, certainly not a competitive side. I didn't even know that kind of world existed until much later in my life. Um, but concealed carry, that wasn't really a thing either um, until when I, when we learned that we were expecting our first child, my wife and I. Uh, that's kind of what became you know this uh, impetus to, oh, now there's this third individual that is completely helpless in my life that I have to be completely responsible for and taken care of and, and making sure he, he stays safe and protected. And so, uh, that kind of started that in the back of my mind. And I, I gradually kind of over the years, I mean, it, initially I, it, it was just a, well, let me go get a concealed carry permit. And that was a simple process in Idaho at the time. It's like just about anybody that pass a background check, you walk in and, okay, here's your permit. Great. Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, not knowing really a lot, I started packing a handgun around with me. Um, and it wasn't until uh, a number of years later, I actually, I actually just kind of was like, Hey, I, I, can't, I think I'll become a firearm instructor just on a whim pretty much. Um, right. kind of silly. And again, <laughs> A lot of Dunning Kruger effect uh, was strong with me. Uh, didn't know a lot of things, but I thought I did. Uh, you know, so I kind of struggled along my way, and you know, eventually started finding good sources of information, good training for myself. Um, and then seven, eight years ago, had the opportunity to. I was already teaching classes as a concealed carry instructor primarily uh, through the brand that we now, you know, that I actually work for full time. Um, and had the opportunity to join forces with my business partner Jacob and do this, you know, full time as 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 my actual job, and and so uh, that has afforded me a little bit of the time and opportunity to actually go even deeper into the into shooting, into concealed carry, um, you, you know, and and that's taken me a lot of places, uh, skill wise and knowledge wise, and I'm still still learning, still growing, still working on getting better. Um, but in a, in a nutshell, condensing like most of 40 years of life experience, that's, that's how I ended up to where I am. Wonderful. Yes. And I followed that very easily. That's, that's so good to know. And I love that you started with, you know, picking up the gun for the first time and then becoming curious and then kind of admitting to maybe feeling like you knew more than you did. I've, been going through that a lot. Um, still going through it a lot. Um, as someone who has a social media account with people who are looking for advice, um, it's easy to kind of think I know more than I do. So I appreciate your vulnerability there and sharing that side of the journey. Um, it's very important to, I think, discuss. Um, I didn't really notice it until someone else said something about it in their journey. So I hope that touches someone today. Um, so where did you... What did you initially start becoming curious about competitive shooting? Was it someone who influenced you or a class? Yeah. You know, it's been, let's see, it was probably 2011. So, okay. wow, 12 years ago. Um, I got into, and, and it was actually just kind of a friend of a friend mentioning something. And I learned about this uh, part-time volunteer state state level law enforcement agency here in Colorado uh, called the Colorado Rangers, which is a statewide law enforcement reserve. It's actually, to my knowledge, the only um, sworn with arresting powers state level reserve law enforcement agency in the country. And so um, I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And I was kind of thinking at the time, like, hey, it's a volunteer opportunity. I'd love to find ways to give back to my community. Let's Let's do that. So I, I became a Colorado Ranger, and as a re statewide reserve, essentially, 
we would support any of the other city, county, or state agencies anywhere in the state of Colorado, anytime we're called upon, just like any other reserve, just most of the time cities or counties might have reserves that they have for their own purposes, but they, uh, you know, could call upon the Rangers anytime, anywhere and anywhere in the state. So I got involved in that. Um, I learned, I remember going through our post Academy, our training Academy that was like, Hmm, I am actually compared to, I don't, this sounds really bad, but I was like, Go for compared it. to a lot of my counterparts, I'm pretty skilled at the handgun that, which was surprising to me at the time. Like I just didn't, I had no reference. I had no, mm. you know, yeah. concept of like what good was. Um, and like p- passing the qualification was easy for me. And, uh, I'd watch some of these fellow officers struggle at times with different things. And I was like, Interesting. And, right. and and then around that same time, I remember probably for the first time ever seeing like on YouTube, uh, whether it was 3Gun or USPSA, I don't remember what I came across first, probably about the, about the first time I learned of Jerry Michalek, you know, and, mm-hmm. and people like that. So, mm-hmm. so I'm like starting to become aware of that competition world. Yes. But it wasn't until 2016 when um, somebody mentioned to me that there was this competition going on and it was called American Marksman which was going to be filmed for Outdoor Channel. And it was all about finding like the next crop of upcoming amateur competitive shooters. And like you couldn't be, you know, sponsored or professional in any any sense of the word. And so I was like, well, I'm definitely none of that. So I'm an amateur. So you you, you shot a a kind of a, a qualifying course of fire that determined if you qualified for the regional championship or not. I qualified for that. I went okay. to the regional championship, won that. That qualified me for nationals, which was held in Alabama in January 2017. And so I went to nationals and finished 10th and was like, hmm, I'm kind of good at this competition thing. So uh, let's do more of that. And so that's when I, you know, it was actually the fall of 2016. I shot my first three-gun match and I did that for several seasons and then, as I mentioned, I, I got into USPSA um, following that. And so that, that, is, that is the path right there is how I ended up there. It was a lot, a lot of it was kind of happenstance, um, kind of right place, right time. And, you know, and it just was interesting. Like, even as I think back to it on it now, is like, I remember when I won the regional championship. I mean, I was the top, top person overall, period. Like, I was like, I did not expect that. <laughs> I'm like, okay. How did this happen? You right, know? right. Yeah. I was shocked, you know. Yeah, they called my course. name first pl- in first place. <laughs> and and I hear my name and I'm like, eh? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah. um but that was also this like huge surge, uh, like a boost of confidence because I, I just I had no concept. And all of a sudden I'm like of course. Wow, okay. Yeah. Uh and it and I'd like to think that I was humble about it. I think so. Um but it was just this weird kind of realization, and I don't think if I had that um, that little boost of confidence from that, that I would be where I am right now with competitive shooting. And I realize not everybody gets into it in that kind of way, um, and, and I know a lot of people hold back. And I would say I was in that, like, I, I probably really legit knew about, say, USPSA and probably... 2013, 2014. Okay. And I thought, oh, that'd be kind of cool. Maybe mm-hmm. I should do that. But I had no clue of where to get started, where even matches were held, how to sign up. I didn't, I knew nobody shooting that kind of thing. So I just, you know, it was one of those things like, oh, that'd be cool, but it's just mm-hmm. in the back of my mind. Right. And um, because of the American marksman and because of that, that sudden boost of confidence because of how that went for me. Now I was like, okay, let's go seeking for this and let's get into this thing, you know, officially as a, as a competitive sport. Right. No, that's incredible. Yeah. That would be, that would be, I feel like shocking, especially in the beginning when you, when you think the, almost like the, I don't know, the competition will be more difficult. Yeah. That would be hard to take on, I feel like right away, but that, that is really exciting. I'm glad it sparked an interest for you because you're now here today to be an example uh, for everyone and also how to connect that world to concealed carry, which is what I would like to talk about next. I'm just too excited to talk about this and hear this from you. <laughs> um, so I want to jump into this. Uh, mm-hmm. There, of course, I, I know we talked about this a little bit uh, at the Mounted Man Medical, uh, the Guardian uh, 
summit. But mm-hmm. there is this ongoing argument about competition shooting not being representative of concealed carry or even self-defense and just in general. So I would love for you to go ahead and speak to that again, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, uh, of course, those two, actually multiple worlds kind of exist, really, because you, you kind of have like, I mean, really, if you want to get nitty gritty about it, you've got, you know, military, you got law enforcement, you got civ- civilian self-defense kind of that crowd, I guess concealed carry, right? And then you got competition. Um, and then it kind of gets subdiv- or div- well, somewhat grouped together in that a lot of the tactical side, so say LE, military, um, tactical self-defense folks, kind of one side and then like the competition side, right? Right. Um, and like, I, I get that. I see that. And I think at one point in my life, I probably would have been guilty of, oh, that competition stuff, that'll get you killed in the streets, you know, kind of attitude. And 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 so wh- where I'm at with it now is I think that, um, you know, there's, there's certain skill sets, like personal defense-oriented skill sets that are applicable to the civilian, you know, self-defender, whoever, you know, just a person that like that's their world is and that's what they care about is I want to be prepared to defend myself or my family or my community. Maybe it goes to that, to that level. I don't know. You know, we're all different places and have different uh, goals and motivations in mind. And then of course you got the military side or the law enforcement side, right? Um, that like I, I see, um, you yeah, actually lost my train of thought there. This isn't very. This, how often does this, this happen great. on a podcast for me, Sophia? <laughs> hardly, uh, oh, hardly just, ever. Oh, uh, never. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> totally but, fine. Um, yeah. Um, so the uh, well, oh, what, what I'm saying yes. is that we got to put things in like specific um, contexts, right? Absolutely. Like there's yes. a context for everything. Yes. And what I see competition shooting as is the perfect. Um, demonstration of efficient shooting skills. Like that's what competition shooting is because Mm -hmm. like whether you're a USPSA competitor or IDPA or three gun, um, unless, well, I guess I, unless it's a accuracy only endeavor. So certainly there's like bullseye focused, you know, competition, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking like a practical shooting competition, right? Right. Um, Those are the whole goal in those sports is shoot whatever thing as efficiently as possible within a certain, you know, context of rules. But overall, like who, he or she who wins is he or she that was the most efficient at doing the thing. Right? Right. And so it's the most pure demonstration of fast-paced shooting skill known to man. Right? Now, on the tactical side or the self-defense side of the house, uh, what groups everything together where they all kind of merge in one place is in the shooting discipline, right? But there's certain skills that are very specific and only apply to military use. There's certain things that only apply to law enforcement use. There's certain things that only apply to the civilian uh, concealed carrier context. But what brings everything together is shooting shooting skill shooting ability the ability to say i need to put a round or multiple rounds on this specific target in as little time as possible right right mm-hmm. so that's where i'm at with it today is to me competition shooting is it it's a game it that's all it, that is what it is if we're just being honest i don't think of competition shooting as being preparation for the real world i do not i don't mix those i don't that would be dishonest, I think, to be like, this is training for, you know, the real world. Right. Uh, I actually think the IDPA, and I understand the the desire for creating the organization in the first place and kind of where it came from. I think it was all, all a good thing. And frankly, mm-hmm. all practical shooting kind of came from this desire to create a, 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 a world where we could practice practical shooting skills Mm-hmm. that would benefit things on the self-defense or personal defense or tactical side. I mean, that, that is actually kind of where it all came from back in the 50s, 60s, 70s with leather slap matches in the old days, Jeff Cooper, um, Jack Weaver, you know, all these names people would know that were real big into that thing at that time. They create 
IPSC, International Practical Shooting Confederation, I think in 1976, out of a desire to test techniques, skills, equipment, and stuff that they could then see what works and what doesn't work and then bring that over into the tactical side. You know, like, well, this would be good for law enforcement officers to maybe look at using or doing or implementing. This would be good for concealed carriers, that kind of thing, right? So that's kind of where it all came from. But, you know, like IDPA kind of create a game that they then try to say is not really a game, you know, because you got to have these shooting scenarios and it's supposed to be defensive like, like a defensive shooting context. And I get that, but it's still a game, you know? Right. So let's like make mm -hmm. sure that we're, we're, I think, honest with ourselves and not yeah. confusing or saying that we're somehow going to, you know, that we're preparing ourselves for the, for the gunfight that we're going to, you know, find ourselves in at the gas station tomorrow because I'm shooting right. an IDPA match today. Mm -hmm. I don't think of it like that. I do think that the IDPA match or the USPSA match prepares me to be highly skilled from a shooting fundamentals and shooting skill standpoint. But it's not teaching me tactics. It's not teaching me situational awareness or any right. of that kind of stuff. So those things I have to learn from somewhere else, mm -hmm. from a, some other appropriate context. And so uh, I think it's important that all these worlds get along together. They should, because mm -hmm. again, they, have, they do have the commonality of shooting is involved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we should take the things it's sort of like uh, i think bruce lee had a had a, a statement or a quote that is uh something along the lines of um oh how does it go I, the concept is you kind of you, you absorb all this information this knowledge in and then you, you you basically keep what's good and discard you know what's not good is, is right. basically the con the idea of the quote i just can't think of i don't want to try to butcher it so that but that's the idea is sort of like keep what's useful discard what's not useful right and i think that there's opportunities in all those different little competing interests of again tactical and self-defense and competition worlds there's opportunities there for sure of this is useful this helps me here i should keep and use that and this stuff now let's put that aside and that's true I mean, there's a lot of, like, if we're doing a Venn diagram, there's a lot of crossover, mm -hmm. you know? And so we want to make sure that we, we have the best, um, you know, the best, I guess, tools at our disposal, uh, skill-wise and context and knowledge and experience-wise. Absolutely. That was beautifully said. Seriously, thank you so much. And I know you're used to being uh, the host on a podcast, so I'm sure, how does it feel really quick to just, like, be interviewed um, after hosting so much? Or have you been on a lot of podcasts lately? Oh, I've been on a number of, you know, other people's shows over the years. And right. uh, uh, I enjoy having the, the script flipped on me. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to not right? have to be the one in charge. Yes. I actually do understand that on a smaller scale, but yes, I totally get that. Um, it's definitely good to have sympathy as well and ha have that flip so you know what your guests are going through as well. That's that's always fun to kind of be reminded of. Um, yeah, but yeah, I lost my train of thought. Exactly. What the, like what happened? <laughs> right, the stakes are so low for you, right? You're not the you're not the host, you know. Um, sometimes I listen back to an episode that I I'm of course hosting and um, I'm like, man, I sound so stupid. <laughs> like, just because I can't get my words together. Um, but when I'm a guest, I'm like, you know what? Anything goes. So um, that's so funny. Well, hey, you know, when I first started doing the podcast thing, I'd listen to myself and I'm like, man, I am so dumb. I sound horrible. <laughs> and you know what? I think that's still probably true. I just no. inoculated myself to it. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> no, definitely not true. But I, I do get that sentiment and listening to my, myself and you know, myself just talk and my voice is always, it never gets, I never get used to it. So <laughs> yes, it gets easier. I promise. Okay. Thank you. I believe you. So, um, kind of back to your point, I, I was kind of reflecting as you were explaining all of that. And I remember going to my first weapons-based grappling class with Craig Douglas and, um, I just bought my Glock 19 and I went up from my Glock 43X thinking, okay, I need a bigger gun. So the 19 is perfect. Um, and then I got to a point place where I was like, oh, I don't necessarily need to carry a gun as big as a 19. Like all these, you know, we live and learn. 
I took this gun to this class. Um, I had hardly ever shot. This was the first time I was shooting with a red dot. Um, I was so nervous. I'd heard all these amazing things about Craig Douglas. And the first part of the morning, we went and shot for, I believe it was a two-hour just range time before we moved on to weapons-based entanglement. And I was so nervous and I was so kind of focused on my marksmanship and kind of almost proving myself because at the time I did consider my page a gun page, at least my journey through, you know, concealed carry. And by the time we got to weapons-based fighting and we put on the helmets and we went into the, what he calls the Thunderdome where everyone circles around, <laughs> by the time we all started fighting, marksmanship mattered very little. And it was so... It was so eye-opening. I remember thinking, I need to just be a good shooter. I'm going to this class because I know grappling is important, but I didn't realize how important that was and weapons-based retention and, or weapons retention mm -hmm. and all of that. So uh, I then started kind of feeling like I had this big deficit in gun handling. So I got into USPSA and now I'm starting to balance my training a little bit better with both as opposed to being super concentrated in one or the other. And so I'm starting to become more aware of that balance but um it's definitely hard to find when no one really talks about it or you don't inquire or just you don't have an instructor that stresses the importance of both so i'm really glad you're here as an example to set that expectation of you know competition shooting isn't everything but um neither is just owning a gun and carrying it and maybe even knowing some jiu-jitsu that's also not everything so is that kind of uh would you agree with that that summary almost yeah. Yeah, I would agree. You know, I mean, here, here's what I, here's what I would say in response to that. And just kind of, I mean, we can, we can absolutely continue talking about this topic. Um, I, I'm, I'm good with, with that 100%, but to sort of put a, 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 I guess my own summary to what I just said and what you just added as well. Um, one of the things I think from a professional standpoint and a concealed carrier and a father and a husband that's passionate about protecting myself and my family uh, that kind of drove me to get more and more and more into the competitive shooting side was what I saw was something I desired. And I saw, and some of it was actually seeing other, because understand that I was still a law enforcement officer uh, at the time. I'm, I'm not, I, I got out a few years back because uh, the schedule got too crazy and hectic to continue that lifestyle as well. Right. But uh, for about eight and a half years, that was, you know, I, I was a volunteer part-time cop and, you know, doing all these other things too. And I continued getting, excuse me, into com competitive shooting because I'd see, you know, other cops that were into competitive shooting. And I was like, Ooh, that guy's like, whether he was in the competition context or in a tactical context, I recognized he has a high degree of skill mm. with when, when, when the problem calls for a gun, uh, he could deliver no questions asked, no, no, no problem whatsoever. And, and there was this realization that occurred and I can't tell you exactly when that was, but I remember just one day kind of having this thought of, well, if, if what, what I basically recognized is if I pursued seriously competitive shooting, it would push my skill to a place where the shooting would occur more and more automatically. Mm. Okay. Okay. So the delivering of that skill just, it just happens. I mean, the, the way I think of this, I think a good uh, explanation or, or example is like, because most most Americans are familiar with the concept of driving a car, you know, mm -hmm. and I guess there's some in the more recent generations that are like, man, I don't really need that car thing. But most Americans see, you know, the symbol of having a car and being able to drive one as, you know, a symbol of freedom. And, right. you know, you get to go and do all the things you want to whenever you want. I mean, that's that's so most most of you are familiar with the the idea of at some point you had to learn how to drive a car. And at one time you had to think of you had to think your way through a bunch of sequences of actions to drive that car successfully and safely. Right. And yeah, I mean, down to some very minute detail, we just went through this with my oldest son uh, in the last year, year and a half where, you know, drive, 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 driving education class, right. He goes, goes through that. And he's got to get all these hours and mom and dad are driving with him all the time. He's mm -hmm. got his, you know, learner's permit. And uh, well, yeah, he's got his full fledged license, but I'm talking, you know, six, 10, 12 months ago. And, um, 
and seeing him go through that learning process was good for me um, as an instructor uh, and just as a father to be reminded of, oh, that's how it probably was for me at one time as well. And there would be these little things. I'd be like, whoa, why is this such a struggle? And I could see, you know, all the gears in his head just like, just, just, just so much going on up there as he's trying to process all this information and process, you know, taking that information, making decisions and turning into actions. Right. And it's like, wow, you know? And so, um, we all learn shooting much the same way, right? Like it's a, it's a pretty advanced technical skill, the act of taking a handgun, placing it in your hands, holding it a certain way, managing the recoil, being able to hold it steady while you press a trigger and not disrupt the shot. I mean, there, I mean, there's just so much going on there Mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of repetitions for that to move from a place where you're thinking through each kind of step sequentially, more or less to where you know, the gun becomes the hand, becomes the arm, becomes you, becomes your brain kind of thing, which is how driving becomes for most of us. There are definitely exceptions. I <laughs> yeah, saw I one of those on the road this morning. Most of but, us um, is perfect. Yes. <laughs> but most of us, like, you don't think anymore about how much you press the, the gas pedal or how much you press the brake or how, you know, what exact angle you got to turn the steering wheel. You probably don't even think about if you actually use your turn signals, which you should, you probably don't think about, <laughs> oh, I'm going to make a left turn. So I'm going to hit, mm-hmm. you know, the left turn signal. Now you just, you just do it. Like the car has basically become an extension of your brain because mm-hmm. you're thinking, I want to go from point A to point B. How do I get there? And you just make the car do that as if you are the car or the car is you. Um, and eventually we want the gun to basically become and any other defensive tool for that matter. I mean, if, mm-hmm. if it's a knife, if it's a, a, a staff, a crowbar, like it doesn't matter, like any tool right. that we're going to use to defend ourselves with, the more that can just become an extension of me to where instead of me having to think, oh, I want to shoot that thing right now. Oh, well, I need to bring the gun up and, or, you know, maybe I actually have to draw it from a holster first. Like, oh, what's, you know, how do I go about doing that? Like, you just want to get to a place where you just, you just look at a point and you go, I'm going to make a bullet hole appear there. Mm-hmm. Gun comes up, <laughs> you aim, yeah. you don't think about it. You just do it. Bam. Mm-hmm. Bullet hole appears. Cool. Right. Like that's, that was the realization I had was I want the shooting part of the process to become as automatic as possible because then I knew and I realized that then solving all of the way more complex things, the, the more, because shooting again is a, is a more defined technical thing, but there's so many things in the self-defense world that are not that well-defined that are more nebulous, that are more um, esoteric, that are more, mm-hmm. you know, you know what I mean, right? Like mm-hmm. even just talking about anything to do with managing unknown contacts or situational mm-hmm. awareness, like that is not like, yeah, there's some principles involved, but it is not a black and white perfect science because it just, it, it just isn't. There's too many variables and it's pe- other people get to make decisions and choices that I don't get to predict perfectly every time. And that, you know, is going to throw a, a wrench into my plans. And so, um, that was basically the realization was I want to push my shooting skill to a place where I don't have to think about it because all that other stuff takes more brain processing power. And, and, and ultimately I want those other skills too, to become more and more automatic. Obviously the more you practice, uh, you know, verbal de- de-escalation and communication skills and, you know, all that. And, and, and of course the hand to hand combative side too. I mean, like the more and more and more of that, that you can make subconsciously competent for yourself, the better off you're going to be. But for me, yeah, shooting is where it's at. And so I've pushed myself to, to elevate that to a place of, of not always perfect automaticity, but dang near. Absolutely. I Every time I hear about a situation, and it hasn't been very frequent, and it might just be because I'm, you know, I'm not keeping up with it very much, but the situations where there's a mall shooter and someone mm. takes a shot from like 20 yards away, something crazy. And like, it's not in that zero to five foot range. It's actually quite yep. far. Um, those are, those are the times where I think, oh gosh, I'm so glad I do USPSA. Not that we even shoot that 
terribly far away, but you shoot enough where you have to have the skills to shoot uh, even at close ranges in a pretty small box, depending on the the stage and the setup. So um, when you hear of situations like that, do you have kind of the same, it's almost like validating, like, I'm glad I do what I do. Does that happen to you? Yeah. yeah, you know, yes, absolutely. Okay. And I've had opportunities to par- participate in, and I've even actually at one time ran force on force training. Uh, oh, nice. But I love being on the participation par- participation side of it, mm-hmm. uh, and that's where it is especially validating because force on forces. I mean, you mentioned Craig Douglas's class. Uh, mm-hmm. I imagine that was the ECQC class. Yes. Um, you know, th- that's some of those force on force simulations are about as close to the real thing as we can get without, you know, putting people's lives in actual jeopardy. And, and every time I've participated in something like that, um, this perspective that I've just shared as far as, you know, taking, you know, pushing my shooting skill to a place of automaticity, it is absolutely reinforced in those force on force contexts because, I mean, I remember doing, you know, participating in a, in a scenario and I just remember getting done and, you know, it went well for me, I would say. Right. You know, and I just remember like the, uh, the adversary in that scenario, like he basically comes over and he's like, dude, like, he's like, I just couldn't get a shot in, you know, like, and you just kept drilling. Like, he's like, it's like, come on, man. Like, give me a break, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Like he, yeah. it was very clear that, that like, I wasn't even thinking about what i i just executed the thing you know i just ran the right. the, the the code if you will if there like if you think of it from like a programming standpoint like in my mm-hmm. brain it was like oh here's the problem here's the scenario here's the context like once i solved all that piece and it's like deliver shots on target you know mm-hmm. that becomes the the output of all that calculation it was like draw bam 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 and then like i'm going to keep doing that until he falls, stops, runs away, does something, you know, that right. stops threatening my life essentially. Right. And it was just, I was just executing the code, you know, yeah. and I get done threats stopped and he just comes over. He's like, man, like I, you, you basically just overwhelmed me, you know, with, right. with your, your hit your rounds on target. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Cause I wasn't even thinking of, I mean, I, I mean, I just was doing it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. No, that's good to know. I appreciate you sharing that perspective. And even I feel like maybe sometimes people just need to experience that too. And like those, for, experience it firsthand to kind of see, like feel that balance of, I'm, I'm losing my words here. Now that we've talked about, <laughs> now that we've talked about um, <laughs> losing a train of thought, it's like I jinxed you. hovering over me. You did. This is your fault. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> but seriously, thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, I know that another thing you're particularly passionate about talking about is the um, kind of the gear versus training importance of like, is someone who has never shot better off with the best gear available or is it really about their skill level? Um, Is that something you would feel like talking about today on the podcast? Sure. You know, uh, and of course, if there's an angle you want me to take, I'm, I'm all (laughs) ears, but just go for it. Okay. You're letting me loose. Oh boy. Uh, Yes. (laughs) I apologize in advance. (laughs) No, but um, you know, a while back I did a uh, post on my social media. I, I, I did like this, it was a standard uh, distribution uh, graph, you know, uh, where, you know, you kind of have this peak in the middle, right? And then, you know, one standard deviation is, and, and two standard deviations, whatever. You kind of see how that falls off. Um, you hit a point of diminishing returns, whatever. And I posted that and I kind of made this correlation to skill and kind of just where a lot of people are. Um, and I thought that post led to a lot of good discussion. And and some of what I was trying to communicate with that was how does, does the equipment that we use, the gear that we use, does it matter? Well, of course it does to some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting is kind of through a person's journey, initially, when you are brand spanking new, from and there's a lot of nuance to this, but when you're brand new, it almost doesn't matter what you use because you're, you're just learning and, mm-hmm. and you suck. <laughs> like just to be frank about it, like that's yeah. just the truth. Like, cause yep. it, 
you're brand new to it. So mm-hmm. I could put a $5,000 custom gun. Actually, in today's prices, it's more like, you know, to get a really good high-end custom gun, it's more like $8,000. Mm-hmm. I could put an $8,000 2011 in your hands with an optic and all the bells and whistles and trinkets. And I could put a $200, you know, uh, bottom of the barrel, you know, name your cheap brand out there, pistol in your hand. And you probably still struggle to hit a broadside of a barn. That's <laughs> fair. Know? Absolutely. So, yes. so initially, like the equipment doesn't really matter, you know. Now, mm-hmm. now the nuance there is that there's definitely some pitfalls. Like I, I just, you know, came across a social media post of a friend and a fellow instructor uh, yesterday or the day before. And they were talking about, you know, kind of the classic, uh, I mean, it's become classic. I see, you know, this I think is becoming an accepted, um, you know, thought process, Mm -hmm. which is, hey, husbands and boyfriends and men out there, stop telling your sweet old missus to go get themselves a five-shot J-frame revolver for their first gun. Um, Because, unfortunately, that's been true (laughs) for a number of people. Mm -hmm. And she basically just talked about having, like, you know, three students in her most most recent class that were, that showed up with revolvers and it being kind of a struggle fest. Yes. And it's like, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so the nuance here is that, yeah, um, good equipment or at least proper equipment for the individual, uh, that facilitates the learning. That's key. That's for Mm -hmm. sure. So we do need to recognize that. And the other half, the other side of this is that if, if particularly the person cares about, um, using that equipment to save their life, like it needs to work. It Mm -hmm. needs to be reliable. Uh, If it's not reliable, if it doesn't function like when it's supposed to, how it's supposed to, we got a problem because, you know, now we set ourselves up for failure, um, you you know, because you might need to draw that gun and use it to save your life today. And all of a sudden you get a click instead of a bang, you know, that's a Mm -hmm. problem, right? Right. Uh, So, and, 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 you know, being all like, well, I've got 500 rounds through it and no problems, you know, works for me. That's mm-hmm. not good enough, unfortunately, right. you know. So mm-hmm. so the challenge here is we have folks, you know, across a wide spectrum of skill and understanding um, that we always need to be, you know, we need to cater to as best we can. And that's not always easy because, you know, a high level person and a low level skilled person um, need different things at different times in their journey. But uh I always, you know, like to just say, hey, make sure you get something that that is known for working, that it's reliable. And how do you know that? Well, you know, there's some pretty good evidence out there of the things that work. Like you mentioned, uh, I'll mention a specific brand here too, Glock. Mm -hmm. Hey, pretty well-known track record of of performance over the last four plus decades. Well, it's hard to go wrong with that. And it might not be the, yes. you know, the sexiest gun in, in, in the world. Um, <laughs> right. it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's your Honda Civic of, <laughs> yeah. or your Toyota Camry. I was about to say Toyota world. Camry. Yes. Absolutely. You know? Yes. Yeah. You know, like, like you know, it's going to work, you know, it's going to fire up, you know, it's going to get you from point A to point B. Uh, it's not going to do it super, you know, fancy. It, it's just going to do the thing. Well, okay. <laughs> yes. It's hard to go wrong with that choice. Right. Um, so anyway, I just. I'm getting a little bit lost in the weeds here, but no, I, so, I'm so back to this, you know, early on the equipment almost doesn't matter because you're not good enough to, to make use of the equipment effectively anyway, but you do want right. something that works reliably and is going to support your learning. Um, and, you know, so you, you advance your skill as quickly as possible. Right. The high level shooter, I'm going to the other end of the spectrum. Uh, it almost doesn't matter what they use because just about anything you put in their hands, they can put to good use to, you know, they can use effectively because they just have so such a, a, a depth, a breadth and a wealth of skill and experience. Right. Right. And so, um, yeah, equipment, the gear doesn't matter so much because the skill basically negates, you know, any shortcomings in the gear to a point. Obviously you can have, again, something that is so of such poor quality that, you know, that even the the highest level shooter can't, you know, uh, depend on, depend upon it to save their life in the middle range there, more in that middle portion of the distribution curve. That's where, um, I think 
the the nuance really sh- you know kind of shines as far as that that that's where the shooter need like they've already gotten to a certain point they're pretty skilled they kind of know what they're doing um and and they they're trying to get to the next level and that middle plateau kind of region uh, you're going to spend some time there for sure you know because right. it, that's just the way it goes um that's where it's it probably makes sense to start kind of tinkering with things. Mm-hmm. So you kind of need to be at a place where you you have pretty good, pretty solid skill and fundamentals in place. And at that point, that's where I'm like, okay, you want to start messing around, you know, doing something different with your trigger or uh, changing up, I don't know, mag releases and, you know, make, kind of customizing the gun more to you. That's right. probably where it starts mm-hmm. to, to make sense, you know, a little bit more. Yes. Um, but w- what's weird is a lot of times you see these, th- this kind of example I'm describing flipped on its head, especially on the lower skilled side of things where people, they, they go out and they buy a gun and they, they mostly buy it based off of looks and feel like, oh, it feels good in my hand. They haven't even shot it yet. They're just like, ah, it felt good in the hand. So, you know, that's the one. Um, and then the very next thing is, Go to the Facebooks. Hey, guy. Hey, gang. Uh, what should I swap out first? Trigger, mag catch, sights? Should I put it on? You know, like they start mm-hmm. like immediately wanting to accessorize the thing. And it's like, no, spend yes. some time with that first and go learn how to shoot it. You know, and then yes. maybe come back with that. You know, I'm right. not going to tell people it's, you know, it's America. Like, I'm not going to tell them what, you know, <laughs> right. like they can't, you know, do something to their gun. You know, no, feel free. But if we're having a serious conversation about, skill development and and as it relates to equipment um i spent a long time a long time with stock equipment and probably honestly longer than i should have um because i remember a day in fact it first happened for me on an ar-15 i was competing in three gun um, and did so for a couple of seasons with still using a standard mil spec trigger and anybody knows a mil spec AR trigger is nothing special. I mean, it's fairly heavy, fairly stiff, uh, not soup like you kind of have this wall. I mean, well, it's a wall right from the get go. Mm-hmm. And you're like, mm, bang. You know, you're like, oh, there yes. it is. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was running a standard mil spec trigger for a couple of seasons and three gun, and I was competing and holding my own against some pretty good shooters. It's amazing. And then one day I'm like, I see one of these fancy triggers for my AR. <laughs> oh man, two hundred bucks. I'm not sure if the juice is worth the squeeze. Right, right. But I was like, all right, two hundred bucks. Let's try it. You know. Yeah. And I put that new, you know, high end trigger in, and it was like, oh. you know, it just it it was actually. I just remember thinking, I'm like, wow, this is so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so and, funny. And, and, yeah, you know, and and yeah. so, yeah. like, clearly, I was already really good with the standard great equipment but when you make your job easier and you Mm -hmm. have some and i'm not saying like i was the best shooter ever and i'm still not the best shooter ever trying to be but but when you're at a place where you're kind of good there's a point where when you make the shooting part easier on yourself yeah it helps you realize um this like i I, what i would say it is the skill is there already within you it's just now the equipment starting to hold you back a little bit right and so you you kind of break those shackles off and all of a sudden you're like whoo and it just becomes so much easier and so um not like you're gonna suddenly turn into jerry mitchell like overnight just because you swapped out a trigger but it certainly is gonna help when you know the skill is there to also back it up Are you searching for a brand you can trust when it comes to shooting and gun care products? Look no further than Birchwood KC. Since 1948, serious shooters, avid collectors, and professional gunsmiths have relied on Birchwood KC. They've been in the game for over 70 years, providing us with products that have stood the test of time. From their legendary true oil gun stock finish to the dependable perma blue, Birchwood Casey's commitment to quality is unmatched. Birchwood Casey has also revolutionized the way we train and improve our shooting skills with their innovative 
shoot and see targets. These targets let you see your shots instantly, making it easier than ever to track your progress and become a better marksman. Head over to birchwoodkc.com today and discover the products that have earned the trust of shooters worldwide. Use code SHESHIELD to save and to support the podcast. That's S-H-E-S-H-I-E-L-D at checkout. Right. That makes so much sense. And I feel like that principle applies to so many things. I, I mentioned to you before we started the episode, I just bought a, a new car and um, I plan to do some off-roading with it. And I'm already thinking about what do I want to add first, you know? And I'm thinking back to the first conversation I had with uh, someone who's, you know, who does off-roading all the time. And she told me, and you just reminded me to spend just a couple months with it first and see what I want to add. And don't just go crazy because it's so easy to get caught up and spend, you know, it's an expensive sport and people say that all the time. Um, almost like a joke, but it's, it's the truth. It's so easy to drop oh, yeah. just thousands of dollars almost every month if you wanted to on new little specs here and there. So yeah, that's, and people ask me sometimes you're, you're like sparking all these little memories of like, they'll ask me about the specs on my gun and every gun I own is pretty much stock. Yeah. Except for, um, the optics I add, which I don't even know if that would, I think you would still consider the gun stock, right? Because you don't change yeah. anything on it. Yeah. And I, I think so. Yeah. Yes. The world's usually... changed in that regard. Uh, optics okay. are more of a standard issue equipment kind of thing. I would say now notice that. Yeah. And I mean, this might be a good time to kind of go into that. We talked a little bit about, um, iron sights, uh, versus a red dot, on our little mini uh, Mythbuster thing. I still haven't released it. I'm trying to come up with how I want to release those. But um, yeah. so I know we talked about how does it particularly matter? And this, I, I think, goes along with what you've just said, but I'd love to hear more specifically about this. Does it really matter? Um, should it matter if you have irons versus a red dot when it comes to shooting skill? I've even heard recently in a class uh, before before you answer um I had someone say that they they were so glad they switched to red dot because they they were they sucked at irons and um it I kind of thought back to what we talked about but what would you have to say to that Yeah Let me approach this a couple different ways um, Okay so the first thing is that whether it's an iron sight um aiming system or an optics based one uh it's they're just mechanisms or systems by wherewith we are able to aim the gun or really confirm the aiming of the gun. Um, it's the optic or the sight that tells me whether I've aimed well enough, you know, given it the appropriate level of visual confirmation that it, you know, because what are we ultimately trying to understand from that is, is the gun on the target or not? Mm -hmm. that that's that's all it is is like sights or optic a red dot let's say that it's just a tool to tell me when the gun is on target well enough for the shot that i'm trying to take that's it it's not more complicated than that uh and so um how those are used though and how that's achieved and how that information how that visual information is interpreted is you know it's different based on the system that's being used you know, so we, we all know the red dot, you know, I look at the target, I should be focused or visually accommodated to, and my eyes converged on that aiming point on the target. And then I just bring that red dot to that, to that place on the target. That's pretty simple. Irons, similar concept, but now I got to also pay attention to a front sight and a rear sight and whether those are also aligned to one another, more or less with that now being also aligned with the target. So certainly a an additional level of complexity, although there's ways to simplify it uh, and uh, ways to practice and train it, I think that, that help make it um, easier for the end user. So, but, but again, what it is is, I mean, we're just talking about ways of communicating to my eyes and my brain vis through visual information, whether the gun's on the target well enough or not for the required shot. So um, I don't think of, well, basically, here's how I would think of it. Anything I can do to enhance my 
ability to understand that visual information that gun is on target acceptably or not is probably a good thing. So now what's become popularized is right now is that red dots are where it's at or optics, you know, pistol mounted optics is where it's at. Well, that's, that's certainly being shown to be the case just based on, you know, market data. Um, now it's becoming essentially accepted practice, certainly amongst the more serious users, certainly amongst, you know, those that are above a, um, casual level, like people mm-hmm. are like, yeah, put an optic on a pistol. Like it's a thing. Like how many, right. th- how many guns you see in the gun store on the gun store shelves that already have an optic on it? Like you buy the gun and it comes with the optic. Like that is a thing now. Um, so, you know, it's easy to get into this uh, line of thinking that, well, if you're not using an optic, if you're not using a red dot, there must be something wrong with you or you're stuck back in the 19, 19 well, 20th century. Right, um, right. I think my own experience could show that you can still absolutely be very effective with iron sights on a gun. Uh, and that's going to be, that's going to re- remain to be true for, I think, a long, long time. Um, but does an optic, I think, simplify it? Yeah, I think it does. And I think for a lot of people, it, it makes a lot of sense. I think if I was starting out with a brand new shooter, I would start them with a simple, simple to use, basic, reliable handgun with a pistol mounted optic on it. Because then what I've done is set them up to begin learning that that gun, that learning the skill of shooting a handgun, where I've removed some of the complexity, and by that, the complexity of target, front sight, rear sight, and getting that all lined up and understanding what that information is telling them. It's much simpler to just be like, hey, look at the target, and when the red dot thing, or green, as more and more are starting to use, when that's on there, you send the shot, you know? Right. Um, that's simple. That, that that removes, we talk about trying to get shooting to more of a place of automaticity or subconscious competence. Uh, anything we can remove as roadblocks uh, is going to be helpful in, in advancing that. And I think when you start people out learning on the optic, uh, they they just learn how to use it and they don't have that difficult and sometimes awkward transition period that Long-time iron sight users sometimes experience going over to the optic, and they're like, "Where's my dot? Where's my dot? Right. Where's my dot?" You know. <laughs> yes, uh, and yes. so, uh, you know, if you learn that from the get-go, that 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 transition, if you will, there's not so much transition to that point, but just learning how to do that um, is, I think, a lot smoother uh, for for most people, based on what I've witnessed. And I mean, I've witnessed that with my kids. And I think especially with like the younger generation that have come up on like video games and stuff, playing Call of Duty and, you know, of course, back yeah. in my in my generation, it was Halo and uh, oh, Halo yeah. was freaking, you know, awesome. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, y- you you put the, the dot thingy on the target and you send it, you know, and, yes, and like yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that clicks yeah. for a lot of uh, for a lot of folks uh, that, that are familiar with that concept uh, from like a gaming standpoint. Um, but. Yes. What I learned uh, through my experience going to USPSA production nationals a little more than a year ago was I went basically cold turkey, hadn't really sh- shot irons, at least in a serious capacity leading up to that point for a couple of years. And I'm like, I'm going to go shoot production nationals. Why? Well, because I want to. And so that meant putting down the optic gun for a while and picking up irons. And I had about a mm, three three or four week transition period. And honestly, during that three week, three or four week period, I was so busy teaching at training conferences and stuff. I didn't really get that much practice for myself. Yeah. Uh, so I pretty much just like, all right, let's pick up the, pick up the iron sight gun and here we go. And I remember going wow. to nationals and the curious thing was, is I thought, I kind of thought I would struggle a little bit with a- having to aim on irons again. And I think that some people do uh, <laughs> making the, the, red dot to iron sight transition. Sometimes we're like, Oh my gosh, you know, trying to see those irons again. Um, I had, uh, spent some time, you know, talking to my buddy, Tim Heron and talking to 
um, you know, other tr trusted friends and folks in the industry, friends, friends of mine that, you know, know how to shoot really good. And one thing I remember learning from Tim Heron a couple of years back was talks about anchoring the rear sight on the target. And, and it, I think the first time I heard it, I didn't quite understand what he meant, but this is what it means to me now. Mm -hmm. The rear sight sits right directly above kind of the web portion of your hand. It's just slightly forward of your wrist. That rear sight relative to everything else doesn't really move that much. You know, as long as your hand mm -hmm. isn't moving much, the rear sight's going to be right there, right above it. Okay. And so if I make sure I just get that rear sight on there, okay, no big deal. And then keep it mm -hmm. there and then treat that rear sight like, like it's an optic window of sorts. It's an aperture, if you will, a window mm -hmm. that you're looking through. And then I just target focus. This is what I do with iron sights. So I'm target focused. And then I'm just looking for that front sight, which I like to use like a fiber optic front sight, or at the very least, uh, something that's bright enough or has enough contrast as a dot or something in that front sight that it's very apparent when it's there versus not when it's meaning when it's there in that little box, which is my rear sight. So target focused, get that rear sight, that notch up on there. And then, oh, hey, there's that bright red or bright green fiber optic or that orange thing or whatever, whatever that high contrast front sight is. And when it's in the window, send it. Well, that's kind of like how you use a red dot. You look at the target, you aim at it, you bring the gun over there. That optic window is going to surround the target. It's kind of like your rear sight. And then you're mm -hmm. going to look for that red dot. So I just basically learned to use the iron sights as if it was a red dot. And it's not quite a perfect um, comparison in that way. But you'd be surprised how well it actually can work. And that's visually, it's how I perceive it as well. So I, I, I don't really, I don't really think of it as being all that different now. I just go, you know, rear, rear notch window thing, rear sight, look for a bright, you know, front sight thing in there and put that on the target and then send it. And then you just got to learn through a little bit of trial and error of just how perfectly you got to get that thing centered in that rear notch based on the relative size or difficulty of the target. And then that, that, that's obviously where most, most people fail. <laughs> it's right. like, that's ultimately the tricky part is, you know, how, how perfect I got to get those irons. But, um, approaching it in that manner simplified it greatly for me stopping cold Turkey on the optics for, I've been shooting optics only for, for the most part for five ish years and then going right into irons. That was my approach that there was a lot of takeaways for me because of that approach and going through that process and shooting nationals uh, in production division at that time. Uh, and cause I think prior to that, I was sort of the attitude of optics are superior. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that there's still a strong case to be made for that, but I don't think irons have to be as much of a handicap as what the, uh, popular opinions of the day would have you believe. Absolutely. No, I, I truly appreciate that. Sounds like such a, I feel like you just kind of cleared up that gray area really well, at least for me. So it's, it, it's interesting you say that and here I am stumbling again over my own words. Um, but I recently started teaching basic pistol and I had a student ask me this. I almost want to write her and be like, Hey, so I've learned a little bit more. Um, but she asked me, should I start on irons or should I start with a red dot? And I told her, I thought she should, she should start with irons in a way, because I thought that was almost like a, the way you learn almost fundamentally, even though I understand site acquisition or target acquisition is a little bit different for both. So, um, in a way it's, it's not, does, it doesn't have to be a precursor. And I'm just now kind of realizing that, um, it makes total sense. I, I remember going from irons to red dot and there is, there is a big adjustment. It, it changes a lot about, um, well, at least for me at the time, because I, just knew enough about irons that like I was kind of gripping onto that before I, you know, shot a red dot for the first time. So I really appreciate that perspective. And I hope anyone listening who either 
is a new shooter themselves or has new shooters in their life that are going to them for advice. Um, I sometimes think the people that listen to this podcast are probably the, the leaders in their communities anyway, um, whether that just be the person in their family that people go to for gun advice or uh, the people that are just uh, the safety person when they go out, you know, the one that carries pepper spray or first aid or, you know, a combination of that and a gun. So yes, thank you so much for sharing that. It's very helpful to me as an instructor individual and just, um, yeah, in general. So do you mind if I ask a quick question as a follow-up to that? Yes. Because it's so common that people go, well, shouldn't you always start learning a pistol on irons first? Mm -hmm. Because, like, that's the way we've, like, I, I think people believe that's the natural progression of it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But I would ask the question, is that not maybe just a bias because that's the way we all did it? Mm -hmm. Right. And they're, they're it's sort of like, I, you know, I grew up learning how to drive a stick shift, a <laughs> manual transmission car. Yes. And, and I still think uh, there's a, there's a certain part of me that's like, oh, woe is the current generation that will never, <laughs> know, you know, understand how the, 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 the nuances of accelerator and clutch and stick mm -hmm. shift and all of that. Like yes. they, they should learn that. But that's right. just the angry old boomer in me, you know, old man yelling at cloud, uh, because that's how that's because like it was forced upon me, you know, because like that actually had relevance back in, you know, the 1990s when I learned to drive. And right. so, <laughs> so yeah. I think at some point down the road, we're going to be like, we're going to, and I think it's already to some extent for a lot of people kind of there, but we're going to look back and be like, because this is how it is with rifles, right? right. We look at, an iron sighted only rifle as mm. kind of antiquated, not really yes. up with the modern times and not particularly relevant. And we don't necessarily judge, you know, a, a, an optic equipped rifle as being, you know, if there's an argument against optics on a pistol, it's like, well, you know, uh, it, it could fail you in the moment. And uh, mm. so you got to know irons because you got to know what to do in case the optic <laughs> fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> to be fair, if you're running an optic equipped pistol, uh, it that that optic certainly can stop warning, working or become obstructed right. or a glass break or who knows something like that can happen. That's true. Yeah. The quality of them is getting better all the time. Yes, but also there are other aiming. Even if you didn't have backup irons, let's say uh, there's and I've I've done this in classes with students of mine. There are other ways of aiming that gun even without your backup iron sights and even when the optic isn't working. So um, not all hope is lost. And I would say that, yeah, you know, learning how to use an iron sight on a gun is still relevant. It's not, it's not hard. It's not a complicated concept. You put, you know, stick looking thing in the middle of the fork looking thing and you line them up on the target. I mean, it's not rocket science, and just because I start somebody learning on a on a red dot doesn't mean at some point down the road when the grip and trigger pressing uh, mechanics, the stuff that honestly is kind of hard to master, I can easily at that point be like when they're not thinking, you know, this is the thing. Like you take somebody that's already trying to just figure out, well, how do I hold the gun? Where do mm -hmm. I place this hand? Where do I put that thumb? Where, you know. What what part of my trigger finger do, interfaces with the trigger itself? Like, we want to get them past that point. We want them to be able to grip the gun properly, hold it steady enough without moving it off target as they learn how to press the trigger. And we need them to learn how to do that without thinking about it as soon as possible because then everything else becomes easier. And so at that point, yeah, teach them irons too. Right. But if you want to start somebody on irons and then do do the – quote unquote natural progression from irons to optic. I I mean, certainly it can be done. And I'm not gonna say that's wrong either. Right. Just saying I have a little bit of different approach now than what I used to have. But I also think that a lot of the current uh thinking on such things, especially in the instructor community, is probably more because of their own personally held biases mm -hmm. or biases because of how they were brought up and how they had to do it and not necessarily because one or the other is right or wrong. 
So again, at the end of the day, aiming yes. a gun is just aiming a gun, and then they're just different tools for accomplishing that. Absolutely, that was that was very well said. I like that. It's almost a self fulfilling prophecy because this big part of me wanted to be like, oh yeah, red dot all the way, and then I was like, wait, no, that's my own experience liking red dots, but actually. Um, me telling this, you know, particular student that asked this question that she should start with irons is kind of also projecting my experience. I started with irons and then I moved to red dot. Um, but yeah, that makes total sense. And I, I'm getting these, all these like flashbacks. And even just recently, um, my mom and I over a certain topic, it doesn't really matter what it is, but I've had to be like, you know, mom, I really think that's a generational thing. My generation. Um, and it kind of had to do with, um, it had to do with like working a certain amount of hours uh, for pay. And um, I told her like, my generation is getting more into the, like uh, we, we kind of know our worth in the sense that like, as long as the job gets done really well, it doesn't have to be a 40 hour week. It can, it can be a 35, 30, like not even counting hours, depending on the agreement you have with your work. That's totally sure, dependent sure. on where you work. But yeah. um, she was like, you know what? That's a, that's a really good point. And I was like, yeah. So like, while I would, you know, like to be able to say, you know, I spent 40 hours, it doesn't matter as long as I get the job done well. And she's like, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So I definitely, it's easy for us to project our own experiences. And I, I like that this perspective is kind of opening that door to like another step before you tell someone something like, am I projecting my experience or is this actually something that's sound? Um, but I have definitely been doing a good job. I will say the one thing I know I'm doing well is making all of my students um, be at least interested in cross-referencing everything I say, no matter what. Um, there are, you That's know, good. safety rules. Those are always standard. But when it comes to advice on gear and shooting technique, like not to think everything I'm saying is, you know, the absolute end all. So, mm. and that any teacher that gives absolutes, unless it's, you know, something that's safety or something else, um, is absolutely questionable so at least i've done that for that student that i told you know the 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 irons i commented to for yeah. sure so yeah yeah i that's wise of you uh, uh oh, thanks. i would even say now as a as a asterisk at the bottom you know the the <laughs> disclaimer to this episode is anything i've said in this episode should not be taken as gospel even if i say it like it is Right. There you go. Okay. Okay. And it's also a little bit of a way to protect yourself. I like, especially you, t it's the Dunning Kruger effect you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Did I, did I say that correctly? Dunning Kruger. Yep, Dunning Kruger. Yeah. Okay. And for those that are not aware of what that is, I would love for you to explain it. Cause when I, I think about it all the time, it's kind of like my Roman empire. It's, it's always in my mind um, until it's mm. not. And then it's like, Oh my God, that was, <laughs> there's the effect again. So I would love yeah. for you to explain it if you don't mind. Well, Dunning Kruger is simply, uh, you know, and I'm no like psychologist or <laughs> whatever, okay. you know, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's just, uh, you, it, it's the, the easy way to say it is the stuff it's the, you don't know what you don't know type attitude. Um, and so what we often see is those with the least amount of skill and or knowledge often rate themselves as being better or more knowledgeable at the thing than what they actually are. And those that are on the other end of that spectrum, the, the higher skilled people are usually the ones that underrate just how good or knowledgeable they are. Uh, and so, and we see that with so many things like, I mean, you just do a simple study with American drivers. We've used driving as an example in this episode more than once now, uh, <laughs> and just ask drivers to rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 of how skilled they are. Um, by and large, most Americans will rate themselves higher than what they're probably than what they actually justify. Um, and so that's just classic Dunning Kruger. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And that's the challenge. You know, that's like where I was 10, 15, 20 years ago um, was thinking, yeah, I, I know stuff about shooting because I grew up with guns. So, of course, I know stuff about shooting. I could teach people how to do this. Uh, I apologize to any of you I taught you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, because yeah. I guarantee you, I taught you stuff that was not right or correct, or at the very least, um, wasn't the most efficient way of getting to where you desire, uh, skill wise. 
And so, uh, but I think that's so, tr- you know, that's kind of true. I think of like, we all had to start somewhere. Um, so even when you look at the JJ Ricazas and the Max Michels and the mm-hmm. Niels Jonassons and the, and the Mike Seeklanders and the Rob mm-hmm. Lathams of the world, like at one time they were not very good at the thing that they do now really good. And they probably right. would have made the same mistakes. Um, but the sooner, the sooner that we, realize this and understand our own limitations and, and understand that there's so much that we don't know, um, there's the sooner we can break ourselves out of that sort of, it's a sort of cyclical, uh, way of thinking, uh, you know, cause it, cause it becomes this reinforcement, um, paradigm of, of, well, I know stuff, therefore I'm good, you know, and then I share it with other people as though I know things and that reinforce, you know, and and they're like, yeah, okay, that, you know, just the fact that they listened to me and took me at my word, then makes me feel like I'm an expert again. And, And that's where you get stuck in that cycle where you never break out of that Dunning Kruger effect. And so the sooner that you just come to terms with, I don't know everything and, and I should question even the things that right now that I think I know, that's probably the big one is questioning what you think you understand right here, right now. Cause what that leads you on is a journey to um, intellectual honesty and that, that, and if you just continually do that um, and really what that is, is critical thinking at, at its heart. Um, then you break yourself out of that that cyclical nature of Dunning Kruger type thinking, and you actually start learning and progressing. Absolutely, that that was very well explained, um, and especially from someone who's like lived through it, as you stated before. I feel like that definition is easier to digest than maybe just Google, you know, googling mm-hmm. it, googling it. So I appreciate you explaining that. Do you mind if I add one more thing? Please do. Yes, of course. And this is for you uh, yes, and okay. for many others listening because okay. um, what happens is, and I think you're already well past this, I think, um, you know, when you break out of this Dunning-Kruger way of thinking and you start questioning what you think you know and what you understand and you start looking for true answers and you realize that there's all this vastness of knowledge and the thing that you're pursuing um, that you don't know yet, at some point you're going to find a lot of truth and a lot of answers. Um, and you will become, I mean, it's hard to always sometimes say exactly where the point is you cross the threshold into, you know, now I'm an expert. And of course, nobody wants to be a self-appointed expert. I understand that and, and certainly can relate to that. But at some point you're going to, um, experience imposter syndrome Mm. Mm -hmm. where, uh, you, you, you probably are better at the thing that you think you are. Uh, and suddenly you are now like, I remember one of the first times this happened and I was in a room with a bunch of other people I really looked up to and respected and was like, what am I doing here? (laughs) And how did I get here? Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm afraid to even speak because mm-hmm. what do I know compared to these guys and gals? You know that that have been doing this a lot longer. Um, imposter syndrome is real, and it will happen. I think almost no matter who you are and whatever. Like as you are progressing in in a particular uh, field of study or pursuit, um, but you need to be aware of that as well, and. And again, I think the key here is that we're always seeking intellectual honesty Mm. with ourselves because intellectual honesty in the beginning means, you know, understanding and recognizing you don't know a lot of stuff. And then intellectual honesty later in the journey is you're going to be in a place where you don't give yourself credit for the things you do know and the experience you do have. And you're also not being intellectually honest with yourself because you fail to recognize your, your true wins and your true worth and the stuff that you actually do bring to the table. Both of those things are hard, but, uh, when you, when you feel that for the first time, uh, what am I doing here? Who am I? Um, you need to fall back on, you know, look at your journey and see where you came from. And see, 
and recognize the evidences of the stuff of your true value and worth and give yourself credit for it. And you need to, you need to have the courage to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm just smiling really hard. Cause I, I definitely feel like I needed to hear that. Um, I, I really haven't, there was only one post recently where I posted something about concealed carrying, uh, or traveling with a gun on a plane. And I had put locks on my gun case that were not TSA approved. And, uh, I had a friend reach out to me and just let me know like, Hey, this, this isn't right. Just so you know, you know, and she did it so respectfully. And so, um, and the best and just possible, uh, best possible manner. Um, and before that, and honestly, since then, I've just, I've doubted like everything I post. And that's why a lot of my content is, uh, not just make this all about me, but just relating to this right now in the sense that a lot of my content is my journey. You know, I went to this class, here's my vlog, here's my experience. You can't argue with me because <laughs> it's my experience. Um, but I do like, I do have this draw to posting more informational and educational content. Um, especially when I see someone post it totally wrong, like to the point where safety is not involved. And I, I think to myself, like, I could do a good job at explaining that concept or doing my own version of this. Um, but it always comes down to feeling like an imposter. So I appreciate you bringing that up because it's almost the other side of the spectrum mm -hmm. um, where you actually do know something you can share. And I've also learned that you can present information and always put a disclaimer that this isn't, you know, the only way to go. I'm, I'm not an expert mm -hmm. on this matter and still contribute to someone's journey and lessen their confusion, demystify that process. So um, I'm really glad you brought that up and I appreciate you sharing your own experience with that. Um, I recently had an imposter <laughs> feeling I called Mike Sieglander and I was like, Hey, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start this series on live fire. And I wanted to get you, get your, get your opinion, get you to look over it. Um, and he basically said, sure, I'll look over it, but I don't really need to, like, you've got this. And I was like, what, what was that? What'd you say? <laughs> did you, did you mean to say that? <laughs> I was like, there's no way he just said that. And he's like, yeah, like you've, you've got this, like, you know what you're doing. I've you know, seen the way you do this particular thing. You'll be able to convey that really well on the app. And so I, yeah, that was definitely an imposter moment. I was like, I'm still going to send it to you if you don't mind looking it over. And he was like, sure, just send it over. <laughs> so yes, I, totally feel that way you know not that it's a class for uspsa or anything like that it's a women's you yeah. know perspective for something so but anyway yeah thank you for sharing that yeah um yeah. and i share it because i mean i've experienced it and uh and and, and kind of you know when you start to put yourself out there and develop a following and you're doing things like a podcast and mm -hmm. um like naturally it's going to lead you to this place at some point like that's why so that's why i, I mentioned it um I'll, I'll give you one other little uh we'll call it a tip if you will i mean that, that please do and you kind of already just demonstrated that um and i think it's great that that mike uh, uh handled it the way he did of course he's a he's i look up to him a lot and i consider him you know one of those people in the industry i look up to absolutely 100 percent. wonderful um, yeah known him for you know a number of years now and have trained with him and amazing um i mean he is the consummate professional i think like the idealistic <laughs> firearms instructor like the image i have of a firearm instructor like the first thing that popped into my head would be uh, an image of mike seeklander oh that's, that's awesome who he is as an instructor because he's okay he, he of course he's written literal books about the subject <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, but like the, the other thing I was going to add here is that it's really great along the way, uh, number one, to develop. Well, earlier on, you want to find mentors, mm. right, in your mm -hmm. journey um, as you're as you're kind of leaving the Dunning-Kruger stuff behind you. Mm -hmm. As you're advancing and you're growing and you're seeking truth. Uh, you want to you want to find mentors, right? And I have a number of mentors in my life that have helped me get to where I am uh, in a variety of 
uh, capacities, but especially in this space. And then also um, you want to find some good, you know, in some, in some cases, those mentors end up almost becoming like peers, and that's kind of a weird thing. Um, but also, <laughs> yeah. you want to like latch on to and make friends with other peers. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and where I'm going with this is that you want to use that network. So there's definitely been times where I'm like, mm, I'm going to post this thing. And I think I understand it well. Uh, and I think I'm on the right track here in sharing whatever thing I'm going to share, this post, this article, a video, podcast, topic, whatever. But you know what? Why don't I hit up one of these people I consider, you know, in my kind of close circle of, 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 you know, the circle of trust, if you will, uh, this community of peers and mentors and advisors, if you will, and just be like, you know, and I, there might be one of those people that I know, oh, that's the person to ask the, you know, to ask about this because I know they have a lot of experience in that one thing and be like, yo, Mike, I'm going to post a thing about whatever. And that's where they have that opportunity to be like, that's awesome. You're on the, that, that, yeah, that's exactly how I see it. That's how I think of it. You're on the right track. Do it. Or they might be like, "Mm, yeah, not quite right. You're missing something there. You need to study that a bit more, you know? And so, um, yeah, and that that's good to have is that kind of network of of that community of people uh, around you that um, you, know, you can bounce things off of and make sure that number one, you're not dunning krugering yourself, and number mm-hmm. two, that you know um, that you're it also helps you as you overcome those that tendency for imposter syndrome. Absolutely. I like how you <laughs> done in Krugering yourself. That's an, I'll have to start using that. I like it. Yes, yeah. that's totally true. Like ask yourself where you are on that spectrum. Yes. I like it. Thank you so much. I'm going to start adding that into my, my material prep. I think that would be a good, um, a good step to add in at the beginning and the end almost. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, especially from someone as experienced as you. And I'll have to I have to tell Mike to listen to this episode, uh, just so he can hear that bit. Um, I, I meet a lot of people who are fond of we him. Don't and... need his head to get any bigger. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're totally right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know what's crazy? He is. Um, I've met a lot of men in this industry, and um, there are pr- some in particular. You're absolutely one of them. That I mean, I'd say like top five stand out as just you're genuinely there to mentor and especially as a female in the industry, not to get like too far into this, but um, I've absolutely, you know, had my fair share of like, you know, the whole like white knighting and Mm. um, just alternative intention, you know, people and uh, those men that, you know, come in and are just truly mentors. Like they're there to encourage support and, uh, mentor, uh, stand out to me. And Mike is absolutely one of them. Even just, even aside from live fire, I've asked him about my own personal firearms instruction questions that have nothing to do with the app and our work. And he's been there to support. And, um, it's, it just really stands out to me. Like you're, you're absolutely right. He's an incredible guy. Um, and not not even the halo effect, you know, where we see people who are good at one thing and we think they're amazing people in general. It's just, these are like yeah. interactions I've held and um, you absolutely stood out as that as well. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for sharing um, about Mike. So that definitely reinforces those already kind of feelings I had. So very cool. Um, I, I would, it. absolutely. I would love to kind of dive in to your podcast and kind of highlight it because you have so such amazing um I keep losing my train of thought and then it's not like I keep flashing back to our that last part of our conversation um but you have so many great uh, episodes out there already I know she shields just like just passed episode 60 and probably only like 40 of those are worth listening to but um and I mean like before guest speakers you know me just rambling um with my old co-hosts and stuff but um you have so many episodes out right now and I would love to hear um, kind of what all people can find on your podcast. Maybe who would be the ideal listener for your podcast? Um, and, and honestly, anything you'd like to share about it. 
I appreciate the opportunity because uh, I, I recognized earlier on, I was like, oh, I don't think I ever mentioned the podcast when I was doing my intro. I got you. <laughs> um, so the Concealed Carry podcast is the one we launched, was, I think it was February of 2017. Yeah. Uh, and um, oh, maybe it was 2016. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was 2016. Around then. My goodness. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, wow. Time flies. Um, yeah, that's so we good. started the concealed carry podcast and the big motivating thing there was I actually kind of stole the whole concept of the podcast, uh, from another podcast that I was listening. I was real big on at the time. Uh, and someone I consider to be a friend, uh, on, in the photography space, I was mm. um, really into photography uh, back then. I, I mean, I still would say that I, I am, but I was kind of pursuing a called a side gig at the time of basically being like a landscape photographer. So I listened to wow. a lot of okay. photography uh, podcasts. And one of those that was helpful to me in the beginning was called, uh, well, the website was improvephotography.com. Did they call it the Improve Photography Podcast? Anyway. Um, I'll find it. Yeah. And, and uh, so I listened to that podcast and – uh, Jim Harmer is the founder of that. He ended up so- selling the company in the in the uh, podcast as well later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember him talking once about one of the things he considered to be a secret of his success in like the businesses that he'd created, and including this one of of ImprovedPhotography dot com. And he said that I just set out the goal of making my website and my business like the goal was to be incredibly helpful to my audience and to my customers. Like I just wanted to be incredibly helpful, um, lay everything out there, provide all the resources, give them all the information, uh, make it easy to find and access and all that. And uh, he really excelled in that. And that's for sure, because I mean, it was incredibly helpful to me in learning, you know, landscape photography and other types of photography as well. So, um, early on in this, uh, thing that, you know, Jacob and I, Jacob Paulson, my business partner, uh, now, you know, I, I never imagined seven and a half, almost in December, it'll be eight years I've been doing this professional wow. full time. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I never imagined I'd be where we are right now, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, just so, yeah, I had to put myself in back there almost eight years ago and being like, like, what was my perspective at the time? And it was obviously very different, but I just remember thinking like that, that lesson was dwelling with me in my mind. And I was like, I want to try to be incredibly helpful to our audience. Mm-hmm. And I just went to Jacob. I was like, dude, we need to start a podcast. And he was like, <laughs> uh, why? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, because I just think it would be incredibly helpful and like a good idea. And the other piece, too, is I, I, I had already been searching because I was real big and listening to podcasts at the time. Um, I There wasn't a whole lot in the way of concealed carry focused podcasts or mm-hmm. podcasts that focused on that topic even. And so I also recognized the opportunity. I was like, dude, um, we get in on this early on, you know, mm-hmm. that's a good thing. And so um, we did a couple of test episodes. I remember the very first thing we recorded, actually, I think I recorded it by myself. Jacob was like, that was painful to listen to. It's <laughs> like, we got to redo that, you know. And I get so we, that. We put, I totally get that. <laughs> yeah. So we put together a game plan and, and a, and a a template, if you will, and, and kind of our strategy for how we were to do the podcast. And so we kicked it off. So, uh, you know, we've broadened the, the topic, you know, things that we talk about because I mean, 700 plus episodes of like always drilling on, you know, concealed carry it, uh, as a practice or as a lifestyle would, I mean, there's only so much you can probably talk about, or at least at the very least you get bored with it. So, um, you know, we, we talk about shooting and, 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 um, all kinds of self-defense oriented skills, um, gear, equipment, um, you know, all, all, I mean, just everything that we can think of basically and anything that I'm interested in talking about, but we try to still remain true to our roots in, in making sure we're focused or generally speaking around the concept of concealed carry. Cause it is the concealed carry podcast. Um, couple things you can expect to find on the concealed carry podcast uh once per month um, with some exceptions but generally once per month we try to plan an episode where we we call it our justified saves episode uh Uh, justified saves is our descriptor of it's what we call defensive gun uses 
Uh, we we kind of came, oh, came okay. up with that idea from um, the company Safari Land that, you know, mm-hmm. you can go to their, I think you can still go to the website today and find a page where they just list saves. Um, and it started with them basically re- uh, keeping track of how many lives, mostly law enforcement officers' lives, saved by them wearing Safari Land body armor. And, wow. yeah. you know, so we're like, and I just like, dude, I, I, th- I think of these defensive gun uses. I mean, the, here's here's a couple of criteria. Number one, the individual using deadly force um, needs to, they need to be law, like it, it needs to be done lawfully and properly and all that, right? Um, right. Like it, it's, it's, this is a justified instance of use of deadly force. And it's being done with the intent of saving lives, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. we just we call it the justified saves episode. So once per month, we basically, you know, from from the past month, we we collect all these DGU stories and compile them and throw out the worst ones and try to keep the ones with the, with the best lessons. And so then we spend the hour sharing um, these fairly recent, you know, current event type. Instances of of primarily civilians using deadly force to defend their lives and save lives, and then provide our analysis of that. So that's that's a, a fan favorite uh, episode that we do each month on the Concealed Carry podcast. Then we typically do one per month that's focused more around uh, news and industry related things, uh, new products hitting the market. Um, uh, we also talk about legislative uh, issues as well. So we do an episode a month that, that kind of covers more like the news side of things, uh, industry news, if you will. And then mm-hmm. we just try to also, the rest of the episodes, pick topics like it could be air travel with a firearm, how to do it you know, properly, mm-hmm. safely, legally, all that. Um, mm-hmm. We've actually probably done that more than once now that I think about it. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Could could be, you know... Um, Oh, I don't know. Like we've, we've got actually a couple of episodes that are also hugely popular. When we look at just total downloads for these episodes, we did a series uh, that we just called ultimate, you know, uh, ultimate concealed carriers, beginner's guide or something like that. It's the ultimate beginner's guide for concealed carry. And uh, I think we did four of those and it was mainly okay. focused around, Hey, if we were looking back at what we know now, um, what are the things we'd want to know as beginners? Uh, you know, that we wish we'd kn- we'd kn- known sooner. And so we ended up, you know, doing four uh, episodes in that series of just, you know, wish I knew this, wish I knew that, you know, and then put them together and try to make that as helpful for uh, beginners as possible. Uh, it might be something as simple as, you know, uh, the top five features you should look for in a concealment holster and, you know, things of that nature. So we got a ton of, t- of episodes where the topic is something to do with that. Most recently I had on the podcast, um, Gabe new, uh, who may not be, an, I mean, you, you may know Gabe, but uh, not, probably not everybody does, but Gabe is a fantastic so. instructor out of Texas. Um, you know, really passionate about the concealed carry lifestyle. Uh, holy, I mean, he, he's, very active in uh, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and carrying a gun and practicing and, and, you know, all that. I mean, he's just a really smart guy and, and really truly believes in the lifestyle. And he and I talked about how good is good enough just as a, con- mm. you know, conceptual kind of, how do I know, you know, I'm, I've arrived, you know, like what am I striving mm-hmm. for as a concealed carrier? Uh, most recently I had uh, Brian Eastridge on to talk about uh, revolvers mm. and pocket carry um, those are, those are, I think the two most recent episodes. So that kind of gives you an idea of sometimes where we're at, you know, uh, topic right. wise. Oh my goodness. Yes. That all sounds incredible. I, I'm so excited to listen to more of them. Um, I, unfortunately not to change the subject to, you know, quickly, my, <laughs> my favorite, uh, podcast genre is true crime, unfortunately. Mm. Um, however, recently, um, I've been traveling more and I don't always want to listen to stories about death and music gets tiring after a certain point. So, um, I'm really excited to dive more into your podcast. And, um, I did not know you had a segment on like current statistics with saves and, or, you know, talking about like, real life, uh, scenarios. Cause I currently, my for you page has kind of, um, 
diminish the amount of posts I can see. And I don't know if it's because of the ongoing censorship or what, whatnot, but I, I kind of rely on um, TikTok and the pages that don't get censored for that kind of news. So I'm excited for that. And um, I'll follow up with you once I listen to that a bit more, because um, I know we we only recently met and everything, but um, podcasts are so important. And especially for people that travel a lot, but like to learn as they're traveling. And um, I know I started it because it's something that everyone can kind of take part in, um, in a way, like no matter the age, you know, it, most kids nowadays even have phones. And I know when I was like, when I was young, I, I wish I'd had a podcast I could listen to about self-defense and like how to get started with that. And YouTube was still like, not something I looked at a lot. So, but I did listen to podcasts. So, um, anyway, all of that to say, I think what you're doing is incredible and I'm excited to explore it more. And I hope, um, you, the listener are interested. And if you are head over to the show notes or right below the title of this episode, and I will link everything there. Um, all of the links to the different places you can listen to the concealed carry podcast so that you can check all this out for yourself. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Seriously, there's only so much She Shield has provided so far. So I'm excited to have now a resource to send people to specifically a podcast. Um, so uh, other than this, I'd love to uh, kind of touch on, we met at the Guardian uh, conference. I think I called it a summit earlier, the 2023 Guardian conference. Um, I just want to say I've been to a lot of training recently, and this is nothing against the places, the other places I've been, but I freaking loved it. I learned so much. I met so many incredible people. I didn't want to leave. I remember leaving and feeling sad that it, I'd have to wait a whole year to go again. <laughs> and, um, which reminds me, I, we'll talk about this afterwards, but I completely forgot to sign up during, I have a, I have a list of things to do there, but I, I plan on being at the next one. Um, it's not filled yet, is it? We'd love to have you. No, it's not filled yet. Okay. Whew. Okay. And for anyone wanting information on that, I will also link that in the show notes. Um, would you like to kind of describe what you all do at that and um, share maybe your favorite part about it from this past this past one? Yeah. You know, we we had talked about organizing an event like this for several years before we finally did it, which the first one was held in uh, 2021. Um, so yeah, this, uh, last one was the third annual, uh, and we are very Maybe. much looking forward to 2024 guardian conference. Uh, we wanted it to be, I mean, we wanted it to be that training experience that manifested everything else that we try to do through concealed com and our associated brands and, and, you know, the podcast and everything. And we, I mean, we wanted it to be concealed carry, uh, focused, primarily, you know, in other words, civilian self-defense oriented. Um, and, you know, we came up with the name Guardian Conference because we've used the the word guardian. Uh, for a long time, it was popular to call civilian kind of self-defense minded people sheepdogs. And we kind of felt like we didn't fully jive with that. And that that's sort of that that world is kind of come and gone. Um, what do we call civilian you know, self defenders, concealed carriers. Well, we we were like ah, guardians, mm, uh, like guardians it. of themselves, guardians of their families, guardians of their their you know whatever's important to them. So the Guardian Conference um, is intended to be a three day training event that features obviously world class talent instructors, uh, and that are teaching all sorts of topics. I mean, there's a lot of shooting classes going on, but it's important mm -hmm. to us that attendees also have the opportunity to, to attend classes focused around the legal aspects of concealed carry, uh, uh, combatives, hand-to-hand. -hand, uh, I mean, like we had Paul Sharp. I know you're acquainted with Paul, uh, this most recent one, um, teaching some some kind of mm -hmm. like intro to Brazilian jiu-jitsu type stuff and also knife mm -hmm. defense, which I thought was really great. And we're going to look to expand upon that even more with Paul next year. Because Paul's coming back because he's awesome. Wonderful. Yes, uh, he's great. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, legal, hand-to-hand, um, -hand combatives type work. Um, we have Chuck Haggard always teach some mm -hmm. OC spray classes and managing mm -hmm. unknown contacts because, um, you know, those are important skills too. 
Um, also medical classes, um, that's, we think that's critical. And we think actually some of those things, especially the medical is, well, it's hard to rate things over another thing. I mean, managing unknown contacts is a pretty important skill too, but, um, I have legit used life-saving medical, you know, intervention, um, Mm -hmm. as a civilian multiple times, um, over the years, usually in the context of a severe accident has occurred. Um, not always that I'm a part of, but that I, like I came up upon a really bad one in Utah on a two lane highway several years ago. I had one just a little more than a year ago in Alabama on my way to teach a class in a, in Alabama, saw an accident wow. happen right in front of me and, you know, a couple of folks involved and one of those, uh, individuals, was, you know, not the worst I'd seen, uh, but, but definitely banged up pretty bad, you know? And so right. we have medical training classes, trauma classes, uh, at the guardian conference. Um, so that's, that's, that's the idea. That's the vision. That's the concept of a well-rounded series of course blocks over three days taught by world-class talent. And that's what you can expect. So you can come away learning a lot. Um, and it's all, I believe, useful to you, in, you know, as a civilian or citizen oriented, personal defense minded individual. Absolutely. And I agree as someone who attended. Um, no, I loved it. And uh, it's hard to rank the importance of all of those different lessons between managing unknown contacts, pulling from concealment, grappling, yeah. first aid. It's almost like you can't, you know, they're all like, it's almost like a linear relationship. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I may have not said yeah. that correctly, but whatever. Later, I might be like, damn, that sounded dumb. <laughs> so I hope that's <laughs> not the case. But anyway, no, I, it is really hard to to kind of isolate those. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. And again, I will have all of that information linked. Um, I even did a little uh, mini vlog of it on my page. Um, and I have the intention of going back and I'll do a longer vlog. I know that, that it was very last minute. I actually, I met... Um, uh, oh my God, why is his name? John Paul, sorry. Yep. I was like, is it Paul or John? I was like, no, it's John Paul. <laughs> anyway, um, gosh, a uh, lovely individual. Met him at the USCCA conference and um, his wife had followed me on TikTok. It's crazy how the world connects, but he mm-hmm. came over and he was like, are you fit for Fiat? I was like, yes, no way. Like you're, he was like one of two people to recognize me from my Instagram. And I was like, hello, <laughs> nice to meet you. Like, yes, I'm fit for Fiat. So, um, met him and he was like, you know what? We're putting on this conference and I was just honored to be invited. I got there and it's so cool to see these everyday people come together and just be hungry for information. Um, and, it was also a beautiful setting. Um, I know I've, I'd forgotten where I've been traveling so much, but um, <laughs> it was so nice to get outside and kind of disconnect um, from socials even a little bit, just just kind of like being out there and not being behind a computer and getting back to my roots. And it's just enough knowledge and, and lesson to like stimulate your curiosity and also give you a sense of just like a taste of reality that this is stuff that I know nothing about. I'm ready to learn more. Where can I go next? And you all provided that so well. You did, you constantly reminded the attendees that, you know, this is not an end all. This is just the beginning to your lesson, which I think it can be an oversight a lot when you take classes. It almost gives you this false sense of confidence, but you guys did a really good job at kind of equipping the attendees with that, that like realistic viewpoint. So Thank you so much uh, for letting me be part of that. And um, also for coming on the podcast, I've, we've, we've talked about quite a bit, but I just want to make sure um, before we end this, and that does not mean there can't be a part two in the future. I'd be honored to have you back on. Um, Is there anything that you feel you would like to share with the listeners before we end the episode? Anything you didn't get to talk about that you're feeling particularly passionate about right now? Well, I think I've been plenty long-winded for this episode <laughs> yeah. here today. Perfect. Uh, I would just say, whoever you are, wherever you are, in whatever part of your journey, um, I, I think this has just been something that's proven true again and again in my own personal life, uh, as far as just helping me get to where I am and blessing my life uh, continually with, well, blessings. Um yeah. That is every day I just, I get up, you know, in the morning and I just try to do 
something today that makes me better, you know, because life's complex. There's a lot of things and there's a lot of skills and things I got to do and take care of and maintain and responsibilities. But I figure if, if every day I, I set the goal to do something today that makes my life better, um, the end result ends up usually being pretty darn good. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, I figured it all out now and it doesn't mean I, I, I'm not done because that's the goal every day is we'll get up today, you know, tomorrow it'll be like, what am I going to do today that makes life better for me, for my family, for those I care about. Um, and so that's, you know, in the context of whether your passion is shooting or personal defense or grappling or, uh, whatever concealed carry doesn't matter. Uh, whatever your passion is or whatever it is that motivates you to brings you here to, to this podcast, uh, to she shield pod, um, <laughs> just commit right now that tomorrow morning you're gonna get up and you're gonna do something tomorrow that makes your life better. And by the way, today is not too late either. You can still do something right. that makes today yeah. better too. So, exactly. um, it could be the, like, there's days that I'm like, you know, I feel like I didn't really get a whole lot done today because mm-hmm. life is life and it, throws all kinds of, you know, things at you. Uh, I, I still got to look back and go, well, wait a minute. I did do whatever thing and it was a small thing, but Hey, it was a step in the right direction, whatever, you know, where I'm trying to get, or even if it's the end of the day and it's like, man, today was just not, not a great day or not productive. Well, you know, I can make the decision in the last uh, 30 minutes that I'm awake before I go to bed or whatever. Maybe it's I pick up a book, an audio book, a podcast, uh, find something on YouTube. Like, you know, YouTube is always controversial because you can waste a lot of time there. But <laughs> find can, something you've been yes. interested in learning about. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, whatever it is, just the day's not done yet. And just do even the smallest, simplest thing that moves you in the direction that you're trying to go. And I... I can attest that 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 works. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And that's such a good message from someone who's accomplished so much that your focus is just on the day to day. I I feel like that kind of that message alone um, just doesn't get shared enough. So thank you for thank you for sharing that. It's a good reminder to me and I hope whoever's listening feels encouraged. Um, So yeah, Thank you so much, Riley. Um, I'm excited to share this with the listeners. And on social, we always have those highlights. So I'm excited for people to um, see you explain. And we're actually going to start releasing, um, I should probably have told you this before, but I'm sure <laughs> you're good with it with what you do, um, the full video footage on YouTube. That is starting to drop very soon. Um, I also have to get over my fear of that being out there because I make such weird faces and then I drink coffee. And then like, you know, when you like, you're like, did I look <laughs> weird when I did that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start um, just being okay with being uncomfortable there. But um, do you guys release full video footage uh, we do, we sure on do. YouTube? Okay. Our, did it take our... you a second to start doing that? Or have you been doing that since the beginning? Uh, not since the beginning. Uh, and we've okay. always said that our, our podcast is a podcast first and a video show okay. second. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. But for, but our our podcast is actually recorded live. Uh, so everything I do is on video and it's live and there's no redos. <laughs> okay. Whoa. That's awesome. Um, although there are times though that I fix things in post for audio right. sake, because then what gets recorded live then, then gets edited and then pushed out on the podcast feed, the audio only side of the house. Um, and we started that, like we started doing the live thing, not in the begin, very beginning, but pretty early on, like, maybe a hundred and somewhere between a hundred and 150 episodes in. We're like, Oh, let's do this thing live with video all the time. So that's about when it started. Oh, that's great. And, and ours no, goes, well, uh, it's instantaneous to YouTube and Facebook is what we do. Wonderful. Yes. I'll find, um, I'll find all of those links and list them all out. So the listeners can just go and click easily, um, decrease those levels of traction, but wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm excited for a part two. If, um, there's ever a big, a big topic kind of circling, um, I'll be sure to DM you and say like, Hey, I want to hear your perspective on this. If you're ever willing to come back, but I am um, always game. <laughs> wonderful yay <laughs> thank you so much um for those listening like i said everything is in the show notes the notes below the title if you're interested in exclusive 
uh, content, you can become a Patreon. You'll receive a thank you note and podcast stickers along with more. Um, you can visit SheShield on Instagram and TikTok for show updates, pictures of our guests, and podcast highlights. There's a very special thank you I want to give out to Sageta Gear. They've sponsored us since the beginning. You can use code SheShield10 for all of your Sageta Gear, which is basically duty and concealed carry gear. Um, one of my favorite belts by them is the Emissary Belt. Um, moving on, if you like the podcast, you can very much help by liking, subscribing, and leaving a review. So for Spotify, which is where I listen, all you have to do is scroll up, click those stars at the top, and give your honest review there. Hopefully it's five, but um, we'll see. Um, if you or anyone you know is a firearms owner experiencing a crisis or leaving the country, leaving the state, and you want your guns put away from you, uh, you can look into holdmyguns.org. They are an organization that will connect you with the local gun shop or FFL to store your firearm for you until you are ready to get it back. The link to access their website and to find a storage location partner is also in the show notes. Thank you for listening. And in the meantime, stay safe and stay vigilant. Attention all knife enthusiasts. Today's episode is sponsored by the one and only Cold Steel Knives. For over three decades, Cold Steel has been leading the way in the knife industry, dedicated to creating the world's strongest and sharpest blades. They've pioneered countless innovations that have become industry hallmarks of quality and sophistication. From their revolutionary checked Kraton handles to the iconic Tonto point blade systems, Cold Steel's progressive accomplishments have set new standards in the field. Their trademark triad locking mechanism remains unrivaled by any of their competitors, proving its unbeatable performance time and time again. Their impressive lineup goes beyond just knives. They offer swords, tomahawks, machetes, cutlery, and a wide range of tools for everyday carry. Trusted by military, law enforcement, emergency services, self-defense professionals, and martial arts practitioners, Cold Steel is renowned for quality, strength, reliability, and dependability. Where strength, safety, and performance come together for over three decades and counting, use code SHESHIELD at checkout, that's S-H-E-S-H-I-E-L-D, to save and to support the pod.